Um, so to begin, we'd like to ask each of you to just briefly describe um, your district and maybe any of the challenges or highlights that might inform a trip to Sacramento. Uh, good evening. How's it good to uh, be at home? Uh, I'm a resident of Evergreen, been here since 1980. Um, that being said, uh, we just had uh, over 3,000 uh, uh, administrators of the, cap uh, of the Capitol uh, less than a month ago, lobbying for a lot of different issues there. So just came back, spent a lot of time up there myself. Uh, that being said, uh, that's something I other had as, as, as uh, acts of region president. Uh, a little bit about me and Berryessa. First of all, Berryessa School District is, a north, is, is our, the furthest uh, northeast uh, district in the city. We border Milpitas. We have roughly uh, just under 8,000 kids, 13 schools, three middle schools, and uh, 10 elementary schools. Uh, we have a, a pop, like I said, population just under 8,000. Uh, we have a large uh, EL population, roughly 34%. Uh, of our free and reduced lunch runs about 33%. Uh, one of the things that we are probably most uh, proud of is the performance of our EL students. Our EL students do extremely well. They do above the state and county averages on our uh, assessment uh, uh, batteries. Also, uh, we recently, uh, as most of us here, passed school bonds, and we're halfway through the passage of our Measure L, which is roughly a $77 million bond we passed in 2014. But we're doing a lot of modernization, and one thing that we've done that's unique, we're creating a flexible instructional space in each of our schools. And it's just a different type of an approach. Uh, it's not technology-based, it's an environment that induces creativity, and ingenuity with our students. And we're putting those in all of our new sites as we do the modernization. So that's something that we're doing is kind of a little bit on the edge. Right. Thank you. I have to just say two interesting facts. I have Chris Chu here to my left, and one of the schools in my district is named I Chu, and that is after his mother. So who is our longtime superintendent. So uh, very interesting. And actually, Will was also a principal in Mount Pleasant. So it's Mount Pleasant uh, really uh, raises wonderful, wonderful educators. Um, we have four, uh, we have five elementary, five schools in our district. Uh, one of them is a dependent charter, and that is our K-8 school. It used to be called Foothill. It is now called Ida Jew. And, and within Ida Jew, we have a STEAM segment, and we also have a wonderful dual immersion program. We have three elementaries, and we have one middle school. So, uh, and in our, within our uh, middle school, it is an AVID site, which an AVID is uh, advancement via individual determination which is really a college-bound approach. <clears throat> Robert Sanders is becoming an elementary at its site. So we are taking that uh, in a positive way to really build that college-bound uh, app in our district. Chris? Thank you. Good evening. Actually, there is still a connection to Will. I mean, I, actually, I, I was at the CBO in, in Berryessa as well. So Mount Pleasant, Berryessa, Oak Grove, Cupertino, then around the block. Um, Cupertino School District, um, we, as, we are well, as well a K-8 school district. We currently serve about 18,600 kids. So we are the largest elementary school district and the third largest district in Santa Clara County. Um, we feed into a different high school district. Uh, the elementary school districts here feed into Eastside Union High School District. Whereas Cupertino, we feed into the Fremont Union High School District. Um, we have 19 elementary schools, five middle schools, and one K-8 school. Um, interesting enough, we, our district actually is in six different city jurisdictions. Not in Cupertino, though we're the Cupertino Union School District. We're in Cupertino, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, Los Altos, Saratoga, as well as San Jose. Uh, just one, one thing I want to note that we live obviously in a very diverse community, but we have a very, very um, active and very um, involved parent community. They were so beneficial in raising back in 2010, on the spot, about $2.5 million 
to help prevent uh, primary grade class size going up and the potential uh, layoff of about 150, 115 teachers. So definitely the parents came to the rescue at that time. Good evening, everyone. Kathy Gomez, um, superintendent here at Evergreen. Evergreen is a K-8, actually a TK through grade eight school district. We have 18 schools, 15 elementary schools that serve students in grades TK through grade six. And then we have three middle schools that serve seventh and eighth graders. Our enrollment is about 11,600 students at this point in time. Uh, that's down from a high of about 13.6 a few years back. Um, some of the exciting initiatives we have underway in Evergreen, we have some project-based learning initiatives taking place. We have uh, started, launched, I should say, two small schools within a school, uh, one at uh, Leva Middle School, and that's Bulldog Tech. And then we have one that we opened this year at Quimby Oak, and that's uh, the Lobo School of Innovation. And then we have Catherine Smith Elementary School, which is our, our northernmost uh, school in the district. And it also has undergone a reinvention and uses a project-based learning platform uh, for student instruction. Um, thanks to Measure M, we have some good uh, building projects underway. If you're in the Cedar Grove neighborhood, you've probably seen lots of change happening there. Uh, we're real excited about those classrooms. I think they exemplify what good classrooms should look like for 21st century teaching and learning. The classrooms are larger than your standard classroom and there's lots of natural light and um, it's just a beautiful facility. So if you get a chance, drive by and take a look. Thank you, good evening everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm with Eastside Union High School District and we are comprised of 11 comprehensive high schools. Um, within District 8, we have Evergreen Valley High School and Silver Creek High School. Um, we have one continuation school, Foothill. We have one alternative site, which is our newest uh, high school, Calero High School, that serves the southern end of our district. And we have three small but necessary schools as alternative settings for our students needed additional support. Um, we have a, 20, a little bit over 22,000 students um, in our high school only district, um, and we have um, feeders from Evergreen, from uh, Berryessa, from Mount Pleasant Elementary School District. So we have a number of K through 8 feeder districts that feed into our high schools. Some of the things that we are very proud of that we've been working on is um, we um, have entered into the New Tech High Network, one of our high schools, James Lick. Um, as part of the new tech um, high network and so they're working on project-based learning shifting the learning on, at that particular site um, in addition we've adopted our graduate profile our board has adopted our graduate profile as well as uh, many years ago we adopted our a through g as our default curriculum for all of our students as a way to get more students college and career ready and for the career piece we've had we have 17 career technical education pathways across our district to allow for students to be exposed to uh, various industries, careers, um, for those that have um, other options and from college. We know that our goal is to get kids into college, but we also want them to make sure that they have options and that it's their choice to select whether they go to college or a career. Um, we're also very proud, most recently, we've partnered with San Jose State and we have the Spartan East Side Promise that guarantees acceptance to our students um, graduating with the minimum criteria admissions into San Jose State University. Um, and we are working on a San Jose Promise with the community colleges that will do the same. The programs. So our next question is about potential law and policy changes to help address one of the issues our, some of our districts are facing, which is declining enrollment. So what assistance might school districts need and what factors are contributing to declining enrollment and what are some of your ideas about keeping neighborhood schools open? And maybe, does uh, someone want to jump in first on this? Okay. Declining enrollment is, is something that's uh, hitting every school district in, the, uh, in our county. And unfortunately, it's because of the very high prices of homes. Unfortunately, um, our, our youngsters, our young people cannot afford a home, and it's very difficult for rent uh, as well. So these are challenges. 
so that we are uh, facing. The other thing that is most interesting is we have a declining birth rate, and I did not realize that as well. But along and uh, with the declining birth rate, people are waiting longer to have children, which means it impacts our schools. We also have something, this is a new term, graying of the neighborhoods. Our uh, seniors are happy to stay in their homes much longer, and we're happy you're there. But nonetheless, our, our uh, young new people with families aren't able to move in. So these are some of our challenges. Some of the things that we are really looking at is uh, within our district is we have open enrollment within the district. So if you are in one area and you would like to go to another school within the district, uh, we pretty much approve all interdistricts, all intradistricts within the district. Um, so that's something that we're dealing with. We're also uh, very actively seeking parents to come in. How do we do that? And that's really through, we have a dependent charter. And if you have a charter school, you don't have to apply for an interdistrict, such as if somebody wanted to come from Berryessa to Mount Pleasant. If they come to Ida Jew, they don't have to apply. So it does make it easier. There's, uh, it's a catch-22 though, and we'll come back to that a little later. Well, one of the things, uh, as Marianne alluded, we're all losing kids at, at a phenomenal rate. Uh, fortunately, we all, most of us use the same demographer, and right now we're, uh, we're probably the lowest projected loss uh, moving up here. We're like, uh, we're projected next year to be down only like less than 200 kids. I say only less, we multiply that times roughly 8,500 bucks. It's a lot of money, even at that. Uh, the, the causes are strictly uh, uh, economically driven uh, that, that we're losing kids. I mean, uh, the very points that Marianne uh, hit were very accurate in the sense that the gentrification of the rebirth of our neighborhoods is just not taking place the way it used to do to the price of housing. Uh, uh, I mean, new people, not, the young families can't come in, buy the homes. And at the same time, uh, uh, Another impact, of the, I should say, a, a, a byproduct of, of the declining enrollment is, is the, the teacher issue that we're dealing with as well. And we're going to talk about that a little, bit, a little bit later on, but I guess I'll stay on topic with just the declining enrollment. Um, I, I, I agree with Marianne and Will. The, the primary issue is outside of our, our ability to control with the, the, the cost of living, um, all those factors are creating some issues. However, in Cupertino, we have a little bit of a different challenge. Within Cupertino, as I mentioned, we are in six different city jurisdictions. Some parts of our district are growing, some parts are declining. And so the challenge that we have is to try to balance, balance the enrollment across the district because when you have an elementary school that drops down to close to 300, 350 children, it's just not economically and not even programmatically feasible to have a school that small. But when we have, on the other side of town, an elementary school that has 1,200 kids, you get the idea that there's a, just a, an enrollment imbalance throughout the district. So one of the things that we are attempting to do right now is having some community conversations involving the parents and the community about what we can do to address that. And obviously one of the things we, we definitely aren't saying and we aren't encouraging the idea of closing schools, but the other touchy subject is always about boundary changes. And so that is something that, that every district faces when they start dealing with changes of enrollment because they have to obviously make the economic parts of it work, but it, 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 may, it, it creates a problem and unfortunately sometimes districts have to do those difficult things that aren't, you know, aren't very favorable. Thanks, Chris. So Evergreen has just uh, concluded, a, a committee was formed last June to take a look at our current enrollment, our projected enrollment, school boundaries, um, looking at everything and making some recommendations to the board. And they recently concluded their work and they made their presentation to the board at the last board meeting. Um, it's, it's a really tough situation to be in. It's really, it's, nobody wants to, um, to, to be in this position. Uh, when I think about what kind of policy or what kind of support the state could provide us, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that would look like. 
They currently allow school districts to um, use prior year's enrollment to receive funding. So the, the purpose of that is to help soften the impact of declining enrollment. But over time, you, it's still going to catch up with you, and you still have to make some uh, difficult decisions, unless you have tons of money. If you have lots and lots of money, then you can, you can do what you want. You can keep, keep your schools running and, uh, for, for very few students. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so for us as the um, high school district um, here, we obviously get impacted by the declining enrollment of our feeder schools, so we too are in declining um, enrollment for the same reasons that have already been uh, stated. Within our boundaries, um, we no longer have the large number of school-age students coming to our districts or our feeder districts, so that becomes a challenge uh, for us. In addition, we have uh, schools at the high school level um, choosing to go charter or to private schools. Um, we have a number of charters within our area, and so that also pulls from our um, enrollment. So for us, similar to um, what Marianne said, is looking at our enrollment processes and trying to keep students within our 11 comprehensive high schools by offering programs such as the 17 career technical education pathways that we have, offering programs at different sites that maybe are less impacted than the schools that are um, predominantly the choice for east side, um, the Evergreens, the Silver Creeks um, of our district, because we know that when you look at those sites, and, and you probably be parents and community members of those two high schools, you see it and they're like, well, doesn't look like it's declining enrollment, they look pretty packed to me. Um, and so looking at ways across the district to kind of um, spread the enrollment across all our high schools, because then when you look at high schools um, such as Mount Pleasant and um, James Lick, and Overfeld that are right in the center of a number of charter schools within that area, um, you will see the, the big hit of the declining enrollment within those sites. And so we're looking at how it is that we can um, improve our enrollment processes and really be able to um, do a better job of that public kind of uh, perception of our other schools. And so if you've been to, to the theaters in Eastridge or heard on the radio, you've seen our commercials for Eastside for our bearing schools. We have, we're pushing uh, a number of our schools from the PR angle to be able to attract our kids back to, to Eastside. I just going through this kind of enrollment, just Kathy had mentioned, the state do allow you to use the prior year's ADA for, for the calculation of your budget. But what the uh, SB 721 would do would remove that 7% cap. The governor turned and uh, created a rainy day fund for his state budget. But at the same time, he created that, that rainy day budget for him. He took away the school's ability to maintain a large reserve. That's what kept us alive during the recession. If those of us didn't have those reserves budgets uh, going back in 08 and 09, we wouldn't be here today. We'd be in the state would be here running the show. So uh, I'm just going to drop SB 721. Thank you for that, Will. That's an, an excellent recommendation. Um, so as you're dealing with this declining enrollment, um, we're also um, aware that there's more pressure on students and outcomes for students, so programs that really prepare students for college and career. And as you're considering adding or expanding these types of programs, how are they funded? How are you able to fund them? and sustain them once you implement them? And what recommendations might you have for uh, implementing them, removing any policy barriers, or addressing funding for innovative programs? Um, so for us, as mentioned um, before, we're um, really looking at the implementation of programs and, and before that, I, I, I want to mention something too, that for us, it's um, we've been very lucky to have a supportive community that has passed a number of uh, bonds that have allowed us to look really pretty from the outside, um, that have allowed us to, to be high schools that um, are modernized in the classrooms with uh, technology, that there's the environment is, is conducive to the learning that we want to um, get for, for our students and, and so that the community feels that the school is really a viable place and that it's really a place for the community. Um, and so through the support of the community, we've been able to, to pass a number of, of bonds. Um, that particular money, though, as you know, is, is 
earmarked for the infrastructure and, and buildings and so can't really be utilized for the implementation of additional programs. But um, we recognize that looking pretty from the outside is not the only thing that we need to do. It's about the programs and the instruction that happens inside of the classroom. Um, so for us, in um, addition to the career technical education pathways that we've uh, put in place, um, we're really trying to focus on creating a college and career going culture. So for us, our instructional focus is getting um, students to be in the classrooms with opportunities and tasks that are going to demand that they produce at higher levels. We call it depth of knowledge three and above. Um, and so we want them to be able to be, not only to be able to access um, college, but to be able to um, succeed in college with the skills that they need. So for us, um, in terms of expanding our curriculum, we have to make sure that it's with that focus in mind because what we don't want to do is bombard our teachers with an extra initiative. And so um, when we talk about things like STEAM, um, we want it to be embedded in what we do every day, not an add-on or additional program that just comes from the outside. It's part of what our classrooms are to look like. It's part of what the instruction um, is to be. And so for us, we still need more funding from the state and the federal government to continue our programs particularly our visual performing arts, um, but we've been lucky that we've been able to prioritize through um, our LCOP funding and the priority that the parents give to us to be able to fund the programs that are gonna get our kids college and career ready. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so in Evergreen, professional development has always been a priority. Uh, when I started teaching in the district over 30 years ago, um, Thursday afternoons were minimum days for students and they were professional development time for teachers. And so the district has always placed a high priority on making sure teachers are able to do their job and do it well. Um, so that said, professional development is always a part of our ongoing budget. And so when you, you start talking about innovative programs or specialized programs, it really is a matter of looking at the resources you have and then directing them to a particular place. For us, uh, we have three New Tech Network schools that I spoke of earlier. That funding and all the professional development that happens at those schools um, is just aimed at, um, at project-based learning. We are looking as a, as a district at other options uh, as well. The principals uh, were tasked this year with looking at their schools and asking themselves the question, what makes my school different from the one down the street? What is it that is unique and special about my school and what differentiates it from the school that's down the street? And so they're having those conversations with their staffs and considering what special programs they might bring in or what they might want to be known for, i.e. arts. Is art something that is special at your school? Is STEM education something that's special at your school? We've put STEM classrooms in at two of our elementary schools and we have plans to put them in at all of our elementary schools over the next couple of years. So um, it's an opportunity for folks to really give some good thought as to what they, they might want to do. Thank you, Kathy. So as we're hearing, offering choices for students comes with a price tag. The fact that we, the community can support a bond measure, the bond measure can be used to upgrade the facilities, but there's an operational cost, there's a, a continuing cost. Am I on? I'll, I'll speak a little louder. So with, with, with these programs, there are ongoing costs, and the general fund is not usually geared and set up to support that, that, that type of uh, ongoing cost. So one of the things that obviously school districts are also entertaining is the idea of parcel taxes. Parcel taxes, local parcel taxes, are really more viable options to help support special programs, specifically the, the programs that the communities are looking for. So one of the things, I guess, legislatively, that might be something that we can go and talk to is go back and discuss the voter threshold for an approval of a parcel tax. Currently as it is, it requires a two-thirds majority vote to pass a parcel tax. And so as you can understand that with LCFF, right, the, the whole thing was local control, local decision, local funding. So if all the local decisions on how we fund our programs really resides down here at our level. There ought to be some, some, some 
the obviously more provisions put in place to allow the local communities to actually pass a parcel tax to be able to tax themselves in this case if they really want to be able to offer more programs and more choices. I would have to concur with Chris on the uh, parcel tax. Uh, I became superintendent the same year that Kathy did, 2011. And in that time, I, uh, we passed two parcel taxes and a bond. So I always feel like I'm going to my community and asking for money. And my community has always come through with a very high uh, passing rate because, as Chris said, it is a two-thirds. At the same time, I feel badly when I have to keep going out, as Teresa said, to the community for <coughs> some of these uh, projects. The parcel tax does give us the ability to uh, keep library texts in our libraries, uh, which was uh, a request of the community. So there's a balance between what our families and community wants as well. When we did a turnaround model at one of our schools, uh, our parents came in and, and worked on it. And it became a STEAM academy, but it was very inclusive with a project-based focus. You know, one of the things regarding the creativity that we come up with, whether it be a STEAM uh, academy or, or any other type of uh, innovative learning environment we have for students, it goes back directly to our general fund. We don't, we're not getting any extra funds to create anything new. So if you're going to go up and lobby Sacramento, my thing that I would recommend is, 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 is take this up to a little bit higher, to the governor's level. We have to find a legitimate way of funding schools that we haven't been done. We've been kicking the can down the road with the governor's uh, LCFF. That was good, but it was, it was, there, was, he had, there was a method to the madness from the standpoint that he knew that this would be, the gap would be closed by the time that he would be leaving office. And as the gap is starting to close right now on the funding for the LCFF, the COLA that's, that's accompanying that gap right now is close to 0%. So you figure two years from now, once the gap closes and, 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 and the governor's on his way out, the actual increase for schools, uh, the, the, the increase is going to be is going to be zero. Yet and still, you look at our, our pension rates are going up uh, exponentially through the roof. You look at the cost for just uh, uh, we, have, we have to look at things such as uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 increase in minimum wage or health insurance costs, just the encroachment of special ed alone. You know, I mean, in our district alone, the encroachment of special ed is, 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 is well over to close to 2.5 million a year right out of the general fund. So we can get the state to fund half the programs that they, 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 they mandate us to do, we can make it work at the local level rather than each one of us having to be creative to go to our parents, I mean, our parent community, to make something happen that's, that, that's standard, uh, that should be standard part of education in California. And there is a bill for consideration um, to begin to address some of the concerns around special education, as well as trying to fund early intervention for youth with disabilities, so preschool funding, and that's AB, Assembly Bill 312, and we'd encourage you to take a look at that as you uh, consider your trip to Sacramento as well. It does attempt to address special education funding in light of the local control funding formula. Um, so Will got us started on finance, and I think I'll jump to a question about what um, additional law or policy changes might be needed to help our school districts deal with some of those rising costs, such as the pension and retirement benefits, um, health care costs, and other somewhat uncontrollable increasing costs. And, and maybe Chris, would you like to sure. jump in first on that one? Sure. I mean, I think as we all started off, it's, it's, it comes down to increasing the base funding for a school district. When you look at Cupertino, Cupertino School District doesn't have necessarily the same demographics as Barry Esser or Mount Pleasant. We, we basically have the base funding level that everyone else has. So we are, we are very challenged. We're considered actually a low wealth district when you look at it. We are completely surrounded by what they call basic aid school districts. So basic aid school district is where their property tax base far exceeds what they receive uh, on a per student basis as far as uh, state entitlement. But the base funding is the key here. 
because as, as Will mentioned, the, the, the pension costs alone, just with those yearly accumulative increases, those increases are projected to go out beyond 21, 20, actually 22, 23. So for our school districts, the pension cost increase based on the size of our payroll is about $2.5 million. $2.5 million is equivalent of almost a, what, almost a 2% raise. So when you look at any new money coming in, the first 2% of any new money is really going in to pay the cost of the STRS. So that's something that is, is, is and should be on every school district's mind right now because it, it creates a challenge right now because really there's, there's really no, no, comp there's no money for compensation. So increasing the base funding is, is the key to solving this problem. Ditto. <laughs> the, uh, absolutely, I agree with Chris completely. There, there, there needs to be some kind of a thoughtful um, consideration as to how we can can reasonably fund schools. And I, I was in Cleveland last week visiting some some schools. I went to an elementary school where they had a PE teacher, a music teacher, an art teacher, an assistant principal, a nurse, and a counselor all those support staff in one elementary school and we don't have we don't have that so what are the my question is always what do those states do how do they fund their schools and how are they able to to make it work and california can't i i i don't understand that um i still struggle with that as well and um because there is an inequity when we're looking at this for our children and our students, your children, and uh, that we cannot provide all of those supports. And why is the funding in Michigan or Ohio or Texas so much greater than California? And we'll mention two, 2008 and 2009 keeps coming up. And LCFF, which is the Local Control Funding Formula, is just getting us back to what we had in 2008. Really not more money, just to where we were. And I think that's kind of the, uh, what people don't realize, is that we had cut for so many years, and now we're just getting to be where we were. So we need to be, our kids deserve to have more. Yeah, and I think it's important, that piece that Marion has said that, it wasn't like we got all this money as it seems to be able to do more. Um, there were a number of demands that were placed on us as district, uh, um, districts in terms of what we needed to do to be able to serve our diverse uh, student population, yet the money really didn't come along with it. So in terms like for us, we had increased class size for a number of years. So this basically allowed us not to decrease class size, but just to restore the original class size of where we were once. Um, and now we're having to look at with the budget situation, um, going back to increasing class size to be able to meet the demands of increase of minimum wage, um, the uh, increase of health care, the uh, pension obligation that's placed upon districts as opposed to the state taking on an <coughs> obligation. And so um, it's difficult for uh, districts to be able to meet the demands that are placed upon yeah. us without accompanying funds to do so. Yeah, one of the things that we were um, lobbying at with some of our state senators here about a month ago was we were talking about the LCFF. And during that time frame since it's been implemented, California schools have received over $30 billion of funds in that process. Now, as Barry Ann said, that only takes us, we're not there yet, but even when we do reach, reach uh, the, the funding gap, that only takes us back where we should have been in 2008. So we're still way behind the barrel. They said, well, that means like you're not thankful for getting that 30, no, we're <laughs> thankful. The $30 billion that we've received, but even with all that, even with all that, California still ranks 28th in average per student capita. They have the, the state average, I mean, the state average uh, per uh, national average is $12,000 per student. And I don't think there's too many of us, maybe with the exception of Putin, no, I'm not going to call it <laughs> But we, we don't receive that kind of, in our district, uh, the average funding runs just, just under 9000 about 8700 bucks per kid. The national average is 12000 per kid. So even if we just made that, I mean, back when we went to school, I'm a product of 
California schools. And I remember we came out, when I came through, guys, you look at the data, when I came through the system, we were ranked in the top three in the nation of funding per, per student. California's gotten away from that. Our priorities have gotten mixed up. So all we're asking, if you're going to go back up to Cal I mean, up to the, to the Capitol, we just need the legislature to get back on track. We have to find a permanent funding measure, not something that somebody pulls out of a hat when they're back there in the back room negotiations, which is how the LCFF came about. And believe me, once again, we're thankful for the LCFF. Because of what, without that, we were on life support. Those of you who are in the school system know what we were talking about. I mean, we had cut everything. It, it, it's a shame when we go, you go out and hear some of these other schools, they've got, they've got uh, 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 the fine arts, they've got bands, they've got choirs, uh, they've got nurses, they've got uh, uh, social workers, uh, assistant principals. All these things exist, and education is a civil right. Everybody, every California kid here deserves the right to be educated with, with the resources put forth. And that's an investment in our future. A good educated populace means we're going to have good people there to do the jobs locally in our neighborhoods. When we don't take care of them, we still pay, but we pay in a different way. The funding formula, um, where many of our elected officials do believe that it's new money and that it should be um, meeting the needs of the districts, um, that message, that reality, that in fact it is only restoring um, programs that were gutted and allowing districts to meet some of their mandated obligations uh, really still needs to be shared uh, at, in Sacramento. And making that commitment to our youth that California really should be ranked much higher in terms of per pupil funding. Um, we, have, we have that commitment and should as a state to our youth. Um, are there any other um, remarks that our panelists would like to make related to the local control funding formula or what might still be needed to address. We've mentioned special education already. Um, I think early learning and uh, transitional kindergarten, preschool uh, might be additional areas. But are there other factors that you think should be mentioned for the local control funding formula? Can I mention one? With, with LCFF, at the time, transportation was one of the funding uh, components of LCFF. Okay, um, before LCFF, transportation funding was being provided by the state. In Cupertino, we have a fair amount of transportation. We have, our, our transportation program actually encroaches on the general fund close to about $4 million. So one of the, the, one of the insults and injury here, I would say, with, with LCFF is they chose to take transportation completely out of the formula. Transportation funding is set at the same amount of money we had gotten when LCFF was created. It's not subject to COLA. It doesn't take into account the cost of gas, the, 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 the tax increases on gas. So that's one of the things that last year there was a lot of lobbying involved to try to get the COLA just to be applied to transportation. So a lot of districts have transportation, some don't, but it is a, it's an important factor because the state is not acknowledging the fact that where we live, that, the, that there is a requirement for sometimes we have to transport kids, and we're not providing any additional funding. For the audience, we want to let you know we have two additional questions um, for the panelists, and then we're going to take some time to turn it back to all of you, and we'll take questions uh, feedback on any of the questions we've asked this evening, plus any that you might have that we didn't bring up. So for our next question, I'd like to address um, one of the issues that we're all struggling with, and that is a teacher shortage and teacher pipeline. And uh, in addition to not having enough teachers, that even when districts are able to recruit teachers, um, young teachers, that we're not always able to keep them here in our county. So what is needed to assist um, school districts in both attracting and retaining the new teachers? And what ideas might we consider, I'll give a spoiler, to assist with the cost of housing, um, not just for teachers, but for all staff? Um, so one of the programs that I know the state has uh, sponsored and Evergreen has just is just taking advantage of is the ability for classified employees who have 
a bachelor's degree to return to school and get their teaching credential. And so we have four employees that are, are taking advantage of that, and so they are about to begin some training programs, so they're going to become teachers, which is kind of a nice, uh, kind of a grow your own model, which uh, is, is very nice. So I think more support for programs like that would be very, very much welcome. Um, special education, uh, I think everybody sitting up here will say that we cannot get enough special education. It's hard to find people with special education credentials. So finding ways to make getting those credentials easier would be um, welcome as well. Uh, Kathy mentioned credentials, and this is something uh, sometimes in the state's uh, wisdom, they make it a very difficult. And special education with the credentialing is very difficult. But also with um, STEAM, if you say you're going to have a STEAM class, that teacher has to have a special credential. And it's either, it has to be a combination of science and math. And if not, then they cannot be credentialed. So this is a credentialing issue that we are now looking at as well. The other part is in a, a, a comprehensive public school. We have, we just went through a credential audit where the county comes and goes through all of our credentials. As I said, we have a dependent charter in our district. Charters do not have the same rules for credentialing that a comprehensive public school does. That's wrong. So my, all of our teachers who are in our dual immersion program have a B-clad credential. If you were to go to other uh, charter schools that are not dependent, they do not have a B-clad credential. So some of the, the credentialing roles really need to be there between a public and a charter. Yeah, one of the things I'd like to mention, uh, first of all, the teacher pipeline is, is drying up. There's not, I mean, it's, it's not, there's no incentive for teachers to go into the profession unless they're, they're, they're the product of their, their parents. There's teachers in the household to go into it. If you, are, if you have a liberal arts major, you come out without any uh, thing other than a liberal arts degree, you can go get a job out here in the Valley, Silicon Valley, working for one of the tech companies, starting off at about between seventy-five dollars and $80,000 a year. You get anything that specializes attached to that in the area of science or technology, now you can jump up to six figures. Meanwhile, teachers coming out with, with the BA, first they got to move the extra year to get the credential uh, on top of that. We make our teachers jump through a whole lot of hoops to get certified. And then once they get there, the most that we're going to get at our teaching schedule, our uh, any of our salary schedules, it's probably going to be less than $60,000 starting pay for any of us up here. So first of all, we need to change some of the credentialing requirements, uh, uh, number one. Number two, I think uh, we, we need to uh, go back and look at some of the credentialing, I mean, the, the credentialing requirements as well as uh, 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 some of the things we're doing here to, to entice teachers. There, there's several bills that are out there right now. You talk about things you can talk to when you go up, uh, up, up to uh, Sacramento. Uh, there's one bill, uh, I know it's dealing with uh, the Weber bill, Shirley Weber out of San Diego. And that's dealing with the teacher probationary. We don't have that many teachers in the pipeline. So once we get a new teacher that shows up on our doorstep, we roughly have, they say, two years uh, to, to make a call on, on whether we're going to uh, uh, give that teacher a permanent status or not, go off of probation. Technically, it's only 18 months because we have to make that call usually by January so we can get it to the board sometime within February so teachers can be noticed in March. If you've got a great teacher, it's not an issue. They sell right through it. If you've got a marginal teacher, I mean a teacher that is, is just misplaced and shouldn't be in the profession, those teachers won't even make it through. But you get a teacher that has potential, they're on the bubble, we, we have to make a call within that time frame whether we give that teacher probationary status or not. And if we do, if we don't, things don't work out, we just block that person because we can't, we can't afford to remove them. Um, something else to add, I mean, so the question also talked about the cost of housing. Um, Cupertino attempted to explore the idea of creating employee housing. And so 
what I what I share with the group was that we were very surprised by the, the reaction in the community. It wasn't something obviously none of us had anticipated or expected. We thought what we were doing was something that was not just creative, but really, really a way to acknowledge how difficult it is for all of our employees, but more specifically those employees are, that are on the classified rank that don't make as quite as much money, to be able to afford an opportunity to actually live in the district or close by the district. So I know that a lot of other districts are also exploring the idea. I would encourage districts to look at that because it, it, is, it is a resource. I know and understand that you know, it's difficult and um, the, the community that actually lives where the, the housing could be is, 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 is something that, that, that could be something that, that um, gets too much of attention for the community. I do want to just make, a point, make the point is that it's still something that, you know, with, if, if school districts have resources like that, that is just one way that they can do that. Um, and just a final point on, on this piece of it. I think the attraction piece for new teachers is education has to seem more attractive as a profession. Um, I think the woes of society, the woes of, of our world, a lot of times get blamed on education. Um, and you hear us talking about where placed, uh, demands are placed upon us with the diverse student population without the necessary resources or accompanying funds to be able to do that. Um, and yet, when something goes wrong, education becomes the scapegoat for that. And so when um, young adults are going to college and are trying to figure out what it is that they want to do, education doesn't seem attractive to them. Um, you really have to have at your core the heart to want to work in this field of education. That's something that you are dedicated to doing. So I think that's one of the ways that we have to change the perception of education across the nation in terms of how it's viewed and that it's a uh, profession and it's a uh, honorable profession and it should be treated as such. Uh, so I think that's what's one issue. Uh, the other piece, just kind of slightly different perspective on the housing piece, it's amazing to me that the housing situation for, for teachers for this profession is placed upon the schools when we're not equipped to do that. And so we're expected to solve the cost of housing or also address that piece as a uh, institution when that should be somebody else's obligation to do so. We're not equipped to be able to respond to that. And, and some of us are being very creative and potentially saying, okay, how can we do our land use and, and offer maybe potentially some housing for our staff? But again, we're being asked to go above and beyond um, what education I think is intended for. bill that we'd like to recommend uh, that everyone take a look at, and that's Evan Lowe's bill, Assembly Bill 1182, which is a teacher housing pilot. And this would do exactly what you just said, which is shift some of the responsibility from local school districts to kind of solve this problem around teacher housing to the state and allow the state to create a teacher housing assistance fund. Um, that would be piloted in San Francisco, San Diego, Santa Clara, and Los Angeles counties. So I really encourage you to take a look at that um, as you're trying to help solve this problem with us. Um, so our final question for our panelists, and I thank you very much for your, for your patience as we've gone through our questions, um, is around exclusionary discipline practices. So we know from the data, um, we just recently did a report on school policing in Santa Clara County where we looked at citations and suspensions and expulsions. So we know that there has been a decrease in the use of these types of practices. So our question is, what discipline and intervention models um, are you using in your districts that are helping to contribute to this decrease? And what role, if any, do you believe school police officers should have on your school campus? I guess I'll pass my down as I talk here. Um, first of all, uh, restorative uh, practices are, are the way to go. That have, most of our new teachers coming out are being trained on different type of restorative practices, and that's a big mind shift from, from where most teachers have been in the classroom for more than 15 to 20 years, They're learning how to use restorative practices. There's so much research now that shows the impact of kids missing instructional time, not necessarily a formal suspension, I mean, suspended out of school, but those kids who go have to sit outside the door, 
for those kids who have to sit in back of the classroom or disengage with learning has such a major impact on these kids in the long run for as far as learning and graduation practices. Uh, one of the others uh, I wanted to mention here briefly that I know we used that had the biggest impact that I saw right away was our PBIS. Uh, the, the, you know, that had, uh, at our middle schools, I just saw the whole climate change with all the students and the kids and the staff were all on the same page. So PBIS is what I'd recommend. Mike, do you tell them what PBIS stands for? <laughs> now, see, I have the mic, and I'm going to forget what that acronym is. Positive, Positive, Positive Intervention, Intervention Support. support. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, PBIS was so long, and you know, such a, a interesting acronym. We also have that in our district, but we call it the best plan. So we're always trying to put forth our best behavior. And it's based on the PBI, PBIS. And as Will said, uh, we're looking at restorative uh, practices. And that's really just helping kids right their wrongs because we all make mistakes. They make mistakes. But quite often, they don't know how to get out of trouble and apologize and make it OK. So that's the restorative piece. The other part that's really important is the social-emotional learning. And that's really uh, important. That's the relationship building that goes on in a classroom between the teacher and the students. And if you have a very strong uh, classroom that has a, a positive climate, the kids learn. Behavior problems drop. And that really gives uh, a segue to allow kids those uh, restorative practices. So social emotional learning is really, really important. And did other PBIS and also a plug to the YMCA's Project Corner. Yes. Evergreen uses PBIS in most of its schools uh, as well. And what, as to what Marianne said, the importance of the relationship between the teacher and the student is absolutely critical. And that is the, the thing. It's not, you, you don't want to send a student who's misbehaving to the office because that's just getting, you know, removing the child is making the adult happier because that child is not there. But um, it's, it's important for the, the adult and the student to sit down and, 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 and talk and have a good positive relationship. As for police on campus, uh, uh, we do not regularly have police on our campuses. Um, at the end of the year, they're there to help with graduation and things like that, but they are not a normal presence on our campus. Um, for us at the high school level, um, any site in particular, we've dramatically decreased our number of expulsions and suspensions. Um, and for us, the, the work is, again, similar. We have PBIS, we have restorative practices, um, and we've re recently engaged through um, grant funding and mindfulness, and mindfulness for adults. Because um, we've recognized that it's important for the adults to be in, in a space where they're okay with themselves to be able to be okay with the students they're teaching. And so we've also taken an initiative of looking at caring for adults so that they, they in turn can care uh, for their students by fostering relationships of belonging. And we do that through various uh, ways across our district in various schools. We also do it with uh, lens of <coughs> uh, understanding that we have a diverse student population and that uh, many times that sense of belonging isn't there because um, either uh, they look differently than the person who's teaching them and so making, being conscious of that piece of it and that there's a cultural awareness that needs to be brought into the instructional piece. Um, and we also recognize that we need to redefine the word intervention. A lot of times when you say intervention, you think it's something that is done uh, you know, to the kid outside of their normal classroom day. And we have to really look at what do I as a teacher in the classroom have to do to intervene right there and then for the kid, whether it's academically or uh, through the environment setting, through the behavior piece of it. So redefining that word intervention um, so that it's not something that's outside of the kid's normal day. Um, and then finally, in terms of police presence, for us, it's becoming less and less for a number of reasons. Um, one, uh, police officers, for the most part, aren't um, available to work at our school sites, um, but also because we're moving away from criminalizing our school infractions. Um, and so we're really looking at handling um, the misbehaviors that happen because of that teenage brain that our kids have, and really looking at the neural science that they're all here, right? They're all in motion. 
Um, and so when you ask them why, they, and they say, I don't know, they really don't know. Um, and so really looking at treating it differently as opposed to criminalizing it. Kudos to um, your superintendent, Chris Funk, who has been a terrific partner with the County Office of Education in looking at school policing and also helped lead the way in a conversation about developing a memorandum of understanding with the school policing agencies to really clarify the role of school police versus administrators to do exactly what you just said about not um, criminalizing conduct that young people have. Um, just a couple other thoughts um, related to this question that might be of interest to the, the people you talk to when you're in Sacramento. One is that there's an expanded need and a lot of interest for many of our districts to have counselors and more mental health support. So how we might get funding to help districts in that area. And then secondly, there's an Assembly Bill 597, which is around child abuse and neglect which addresses the need for a better use of data and data sharing and data management to help improve outcomes for youth and make sure youth and families have access to the services uh, that they really need and for us to monitor whether those services are working. Um, so we've come to the best part of the program, I think, which is an opportunity for all of you in the audience to ask some questions. And perhaps someone might help facilitate if we need the microphone to come around, but Maybe you have a strong voice. So we'll start in the back and see if we can hear you. Uh, my name is Vincent James. Uh, one of the questions that I hadn't heard is, have you guys started looking at your competitors, which is the private institutions, the charter schools, and the homeschooling? Because it almost seems like you might be losing kids, and that could be one of the reasons is the movement towards charter. So don't know if you guys are planning to challenge your competitors. So as I mentioned, one of the reasons for us as a high school district that we're in decline in enrollment is because we have so many charges within our um, boundaries, our, our school boundaries. Um, and so for us, one of the ways that we're looking is, is as I mentioned, is um, we actually hired a uh, public relations um, position, director of public relations, to really enhance the perception of our schools across the district so that we can show and, sh and highlight and showcase all the various programs that we have across the district at our various high schools to attract um, more students into our district so that we're not losing them to private or to, um, to charter schools. And so we're um, increasing the number of programs that we offer, doing a better job of promoting the good things that we do do to change the perception of some of our high schools and how they're viewed by, by uh, the community. To see what we could do better and that's where we have come up with uh, programs and really uh, better serving and meeting the needs of our community. But it is, it is having that dialogue, uh, and I think we have all, we really have done a very good job with that. Uh, and on that note, I, I am gonna just uh, also echo what we said before. I wish, no I don't wish. Um, it is really uh, an economic uh, that we're losing most of our, uh, our kids in our district. Mm -hmm. At first, we really uh, thought they was the charters, but, or, uh, and not so much even privates, but actually it is uh, people uh, leaving the area because we have gone through and actually did the calling and whatnot. So we have been very uh, focused understand where our families have gone, our kids have gone, and we've also looked to see what we could do to improve our programs because it is about being um, competitive. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, my name is Kevin Larson. I'm a parent of Green School District. So number one, I want to say that I appreciate the school board of our school district. It has not been easy over the last couple of years, and we've been going through some very tough times. So I have seen a marked change in the way the school board is operating as compared with five years ago. That being said, I'm going to encourage the school boards to be more flexible and more open to really get it all out there and start discussing these things. And this kind gentleman next to me, Wesley Lee, 
is a regular uh, citizen here who's taping us today to put on YouTube. And so I want to encourage all school districts to have their meetings videotaped. Not audio taped, but videotaped. And if you want our help as parents, you have to get out there and mandate this. Uh, the second thing is, um, uh, I want to just say that I'm a little bit upset, just so you know, because the parents really aren't being heard well, in my opinion. They're changing the school board, but we have a lot of work to do there. And the county office of education as well. They've emailed you as well. And then the, the, the last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, I've made a, very, a great amount of suggestions, and maybe too many, but oftentimes they're not responded to. One suggestion I had is if you Google San Francisco School District parcel tax, they did a gigantic parcel tax for 20 years for all teacher increase. The other suggestion I did, and I wrote an article on, it was BYOL. I'm all done after this, but I made this article. BYOL, bring your own laptop. So I wrote the article a year ago, and that way we could save costs. And I don't think I got a response to it, except that we can't do it because of the Wi-Fi. So we're not really being listened to strongly enough, in my opinion, as parents. so we could do this. And we have a website with lessons on it. I have cards right here in the Nicaraguan card holder. You're very welcome to take them and check out our website, www.rdevelopingworld.org. And also, ask us if we have resources that would be useful to you. I brought a box of resources that I thought might work for tonight. And you're welcome to peruse them and take what you want. Superintendents, principals, teachers, parents, you're welcome. They start with uprooting racism, sanctuary everywhere from American Friends Service Committee. And there are some class acts from Sunburst um, it goes on to climate change with a lot of material about open space right here and a wonderful curriculum put out by Rethinking Schools, a people's curriculum for the earth. There's material for ESL, there's material for diversity, multicultural education, uh, we have been going into the Multicultural Foundations for Education course that's mandated for teacher uh, credentials at San Jose State. And we have given multiple, I mean, we've been doing this for decades, multiple lessons for validating people's culture. Our developing world is designed to bring realities of so-called developing countries and the richness of diverse, cult um, diverse cultures to people here. We're lucky we have the world right here. But if we don't validate these students and have relationships with them, they're not going to make it they're going to drop out. <coughs> Relationship education is very, very important, and I hope you'll speak to that. Thank you. Pain in me to see our kids so driven by competition, right? I mean, the Valley is all about bringing the best, having the best, right? And getting, you know, offering children the best that we can. And in some way, I'm guilty of it too. As an immigrant parent, I just see all these wonderful opportunities that I didn't have growing up. And I suddenly want to get this all to my children, right? And through the process of my tech career, 
a moment came when I felt I needed to pause and really understand, are we really focused on bringing out the best in them, making them be the best they really can, right? And I, unfortunately, I was struggling to find an answer for that because I could have fought all the classes out there, but what I was not able to enable was the values of the heart. You know, my child was struggling to be a collaborator versus wanting to be the first person to finish the problem, right? You know, that was a challenge that I saw real time, right? So my point here is, you know, in, in, in the startup that I am with, right, we are focused on building emotional intelligence, emotional tools, and I really want to see if we could offer that to all the children in our school districts. We want to come and offer relaxation tools, meditation tools, tools to learn to live and be inspired, right, and be creative. And I just want to see if you supervisors are open to it and if I could have a dialogue with you offline. Thank you. Okay, I'll just briefly add uh, a comment on that. Most of us are moving toward that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I just saw so much research today on social emotional learning. Everything, we're going down that path now. When we first started getting some of the LCFF dollars, we moved away from counselors and moved to social workers. Why? Because counselors uh, usually are, are more focused on, on test data, they're paper counselors. We went to, social, uh, to our social workers because anytime they deal with kids, they work on the social, emotional factors, and they include the whole family. A lot of the issues aren't just a student problem. I've yet to have a kindergartner late to school every day that has a driving record that's, that's, that's safe. So we have to deal with the families in order to rectify the problems with the kids, and we found social workers to be the best way to start investing moving forward. Hi everyone, my name is Ez Hong. I'm the youth coordinator at ING, which is an organization to supplement education about Islam and Muslims to counter stereotypes and prejudice. So along with the two speakers who just spoke about school climate, I think it's generally really important to minimize, to you know, create a really welcoming school climate and to have culturally sensitive teachers and students. So kind of to go along with the Sacramento labor, there's a bill 1318, which is the Safe Place to Learn Act, which would um, increase follow-up on providing resources to schools statewide to make them have resources to be able to be culturally sensitive so that all students can thrive. So I'd recommend everyone to look into Assembly Bill 1318 once again. Thank you. Hi, my name is RJ Castro. I'm a parent of two students, uh, not in any of the school districts here, actually, one was at Eastside Union, Santa Cruz High School. Um, I'm hearing a lot of what I'm, uh, real quickly, uh, I'm a, a former John Montgomery Elementary School District uh, or a student and went to Leyva. Um, but I was one of those uh, kids that got transferred out um, back in the 80s when uh, uh, the plant closed the first time uh, was Tesla before it was General Motors, if you remember back then. <laughs> uh, I got sent out to Michigan, and so uh, when I came from California, my school's, my school's uh, uh, scores were good enough at the time going to Michigan uh, during the 80s. But the reverse is definitely not there. I mean, this, 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 the skill set that kids are. Um, I have children that are here that, that are in, they're lucky that they were in Oak Grove School District, that they participated in, um, in an adventure STEM program, which is a four-year program. Um, myself, I, I've, I've been a, um, an outreach specialist for De Anza College, for, uh, you know, trying to reach with East Side High School District kids to go to college and work together. And, and as I'm hearing all of the different types of issues that we're having, um, and as I, a few weeks back, a community college chancellor came and kind of discussed different things. And what I'm hearing is there's really a lot of disparity between, from every level. You know, each group seems to be doing their separate thing when perhaps um, there should be more inclusion to each other to help from one component to the next. Meaning if, if you're, you know, you're talking about pre-K, you know, the program in pre-K should equal, equal to the next level and so forth and so on. So when they are entering in the high school, they're not, you know, suddenly just thrown 
and you know, kind of into the path of wolves who had been really prepared for that high school. But that doesn't stop at high school. It continues forward. And I think if we're able to just look unitarily at all the different programs instead of trying to fit everybody's kind of little pocket, have some consistency throughout, so that way when a parent is looking to change, their change is, is through choice, not because they're, they're lacking something. And I, and I think if we can stay really consistent with, and then also with the information, as well as uh, providing more uh, you know, of these types of forums so that way parents can become engaged, then I, then I think you know, you're, we're, we're going to have a more cooperative um, discussion. Thank you. that uh, all of the feeder schools into Eastside uh, Union High School District are a part of something called Eastside Alliance. And Eastside Alliance is all of the feeder schools. And what we are doing is doing exactly what you're saying. We're trying to standardize what we are instructing our kids so that when they do arrive at Eastside, the, level, the playing field is level. Uh, we're also, uh, thanks to the Silicon Valley Education Foundation grant monies, we have uh, an extensive uh, professional development network starting in third grade and for our middle school. And so we're very fortunate. Uh, Silicon Valley Education Foundation also funds our Elevate programs in most of our districts. So what uh, the Eastside Alliance is doing is really trying to bring us all together and uh, for uh, the betterment of our kids. <clears throat> I'd just like to add that collectively, all eight school districts, the seven feeder districts, and Eastside, we make up, uh, we, we encompass 84,000 kids on the Eastside. That's going from me and Berryessa all the way down to Oak Grove, including uh, uh, Franklin McKinley as well. And uh, with that, we're in the process of now trying to get uh, that there's some state money uh, that we're trying to apply for. Uh, we, we've gained a lot of attention because that's, I mean, that's a lot of kids who are in back. And the state is starting to put some money to do exactly what you're talking about. So, if, uh, can I say something before Mr. Morrison? Yeah. I have, do you want to say something before? I want to say Eastside Alliance. Can I add? I have called the man that runs Eastside Alliance and spoke with him. And this was a half a year ago. And we went over the fact that I don't believe, and you can correct me, I don't believe any parents whatsoever are involved in the East Side Alliance in your decision-making process. And I'd like to be corrected on that, but I believe that that's a major flaw in the East Side Alliance. And in order to correct that flaw, we have to find a way to do that. It's fine for all of you to meet together and figure out what's best for all of us, but if you don't have parents, and I'm one of them, I'd like that. I, I did speak with the gentleman, and I believe I'm correct. And that's a major flaw in the East Side Alliance. So, so I'm Bonnie Meeks, but I'm on the Evergreen School Board. But so here's a few things for us to take to Sacramento that we're working on. I also work at the County Office of Education with Mary Ann. So here's a few things we need to work on. One is early learning. So Mary Ann and I work on the Strong Start Coalition. So it's very important to tell our legislators and the governor, who <coughs> is sort of iffy on early learning, right? He doesn't want to add other mandates so that early learning and, and TK is very important for us. The second is teacher pipeline. We also work on a teacher pipeline um, workforce. So Evan Lowe's uh, AP 1182, which is a pilot program, is another thing, but there's a lot of other teacher credentialing and things we need to work on to help improve teacher pipeline, in addition to diversity. So we need a more diverse teacher population to work with our diverse student population. Another area is the charter school. So there's a bill right now on charter school authorization. That's, I don't know if you guys follow, but it's going up and down, so that basically the only ones who can authorize charter schools are districts, right? So that's very important in terms of Vince's question about our competitiveness. And the last is Denise was here, Denise Williams from our district, who works on multilingual education. So April was uh, Multilingual Advocacy Month. So a lot of what the state can do is to help sort of promote what, with Prop 58, which came out with the bilingualism, so to promote multilingualism and bilingual, you know, bilingual and all these sorts of immersion programs, and to give us money to help fund those sorts of programs. Okay. So, um, I think we have time for one more question. So, um, I'm Franklin Goyasa, I teach at Laurel Elementary School. So, 
I've just been playing with my phone, not on Facebook, but looking at the per pupil funding in other states, because Mrs. Gomez mentioned uh, Ohio, right? It's amazing. We're only spending nine, a little over $9,000. This was uh, uh, fiscal year 2014, so this is old stats, but Alaska spends, um, wait for it, 18000 Where is Alaska getting $18,000 to spend on each student? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. you to live there. Okay, let's go to Connecticut. It's 18000 So uh, Delaware, 13000 <laughs> District Columbia, 18000 My point is priority. So I think we all agree, right, that we would like for our hard-earned tax money to support education. Um, but it's all talk. We haven't put our money where our mouth is. So I think we all need to jump on the love train, the, you know, the bus to Sacramento. And Will Lecter said it. I mean, we need to go straight to Governor Brown, who supposedly is very, uh, quote unquote, liberal, and go and challenge him and show him the stats and say, we need to double it. We just, we just don't have the money. And we should, so our priorities are somewhere else. So let me know what uh, is being proposed in Sacramento that we could support that in would increase our per pupil, uh, per pupil funding. Thank you. If I could make a comment on that. Um, California, if I understand correctly, is the only state in the uh, United States that does not have an energy extraction tax. And that's been proposed many times. It seems to be a third rail for politics and politicians, but maybe with enough pressure, we could get that and have a certain amount of that earmarked toward education. Well, one more. Hi, uh, my name is Barbara. I'm actually a former student of uh, Evergreen School District. Um, I went to a little boys college, St. Mary's, up in Malaga. I studied business. Best class I took, ethnic studies. We're talking about how we can be better prepared to uh, cut down the ignorance in this world, ethnic studies. Come from this major. For uh, the wonderful comments and feedback and the opportunity for us to think more deeply and broadly as well about the issues that, that you're all facing. And please join me in thanking our panelists for being here. Incredibly busy time of year for everyone, so we know this was quite a commitment. Thank you so very much.